Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Horror Mine, where we talk about mysteries, thrillers, and horror movies. My name is Vic Shai, and in this video, I'll be covering the underrated Japanese horror sequel, Juon the Curse 2. Juon the Curse 2 follows the events of the first film and explores the consequences of trying to sell It's one of the most haunted houses in all of Japan. I'll be going over the events that take place throughout the film, explaining the ending and how it connects to the sequel, Juon the Grudge. Juon the Curse 2 has some of the creepiest and most unique imagery in the entire franchise. It is also by far the most underrated. So without further ado, sit back and relax and join me as we continue to explore the deadly curse in Juon the Curse 2. We are starting with the chapter titled Kyoko. I purposely left this chapter out from my recap of the previous film to better serve the overall narrative of both videos. We meet one of our main characters, Kyoko Suzuki, a young woman who is spiritually sensitive. Her brother Tatsuya is a real estate agent trying to sell the cursed Saeki house. He explains that the previous residents of the house, the Murakami family, all died and their bodies mysteriously disappeared. He is referring to Kana, Suyoshi, and their mother Noriko from the previous film. Tatsuya thinks that having an exorcism would scare away potential buyers and only wants his sister to take a look at the house. That's sounds like a wonderful idea and I'm sure that absolutely nothing will go wrong. Tatsuya is desperate to get the house off the market because he needs to pay alimony to his ex-wife. That's right folks, dozens more people are going to get cursed and die because of yet another failed marriage. Yeah, that's because everyone's, you know, dead. They enter the cursed house and Kyoko finds mail addressed to Takeo Saeki. Kayako's murder and the events of the previous film occurred in 1995. The events of this film take place one year later in 1990. Six. Kyoko is lured upstairs by an ominous noise and briefly sees the spirit of Kayako Saeki. She senses that something is terribly wrong with the house and asks her brother for a bottle of sake. Kyoko drinks and immediately spits out the sake. She says that before selling the house, he must ask the potential buyer to drink the sake. If they say it doesn't taste good or spit it out, the house is too dangerous for them. Kyoko says that sake reacts differently to the presence of spirits. She then runs out of the house terrified. Tatsuya's son, Nobuyuki, is watching TV alone in their apartment. The woman on the TV has a knife held to her throat and suddenly begins staring directly at him. The TV he suddenly shuts off and a ghostly hand appears right behind him. Sometime later, Tatsuya tells Kyoko he sold the house to a married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Kitara. He says that they drank the sake, but everything was normal. Tatsuya also drank the sake in an earlier scene but didn't react to it. I believe this shows that the curse is so powerful that it can somehow mask its spiritual presence. You ain't tricking these ghosts. He then asks if Kyoko can check on Nobuyuki, who has been behaving strange lately. I love how he tries his best to be discreet while his secretary simultaneously does her best to eavesdrop. Kyoko goes to the house and sees the new resident, Yoshimi Kitara, staring at her from the window. Kyoko looks visibly worried as there is something clearly off about her. Based on her white dress and facial expression, we can see that Yoshimi is now being possessed by Kayako. Kyoko receives a file from her friend about all the previous incidents related to the house. She learns about the deaths of the Murukami family, the Saeki house murders, and the death of Shunsuke Kobayashi and his wife Manami. So much death. What can men do against such reckless hate? She drops the folder off at Tatsuya's office and goes to check on Nobuyuki. This is where we learn that Tatsuya and Nobuyuki have recently moved into the same apartment that the Kobayashis previously lived in, number 205. As she approaches the apartment, Kyoko feels something ominous. She enters the apartment and it is clearly affected by an evil presence. She finds an Ofuda, which is a sort of talisman from a Shinto shrine that is commonly placed inside of a household to ward off evil spirits. 
Woods. She discovers Nobuyuki passed out on the floor and the next door neighbor comes knocking on the door. The lady named Hashimoto says she heard a loud woman scream followed by a baby crying. Tatsuya finds the file Kyoko left him and learns that his apartment is where the pregnant Manami Kobayashi was brutally murdered by Takeo Saeki. I wonder why he didn't know that before. Isn't he a real estate agent? Back in apartment 205, Kyoko sees a disturbing vision of Takeo Saeki murdering Manami and taking out her unborn child. Takeo notices Kyoko and as he approaches her, she passes out from shock. Miss Hashimoto came banging on the door because she was hearing the sounds of Manami being murdered and the baby being taken out. Much like what happened to Kayako, Manami Kobayashi's death created a Juwan, which has taken a hold of apartment 205. When a Juwan is born, the memory of the terrible crime that happened repeats itself over and over again in that specific place. I view this as a metaphor for the victims of violent crimes. To those victims and their families, the tragedy and pain they endured can never end. Takashi Shimizu actually took inspiration for Juwan from the rising domestic abuse cases in Japan at the time. This is the first time in the series that the concept of a time loop is introduced. Though we never physically see Manami reanimated as an Onryo, the influence of her grudge is felt throughout the rest of the film. Though it is never confirmed, it was possibly her hand that was creeping behind Nobuyuki. The next chapter is titled Tatsuya and explores the now cursed Kitara family. Yoshimi receives a package from an unknown sender which contains Kayako's diary and Toshio's drawing from the previous film. As she walks into the kitchen, her husband Hiroshi is complaining that she didn't get the coffee beans he wanted. Jamaican Blue Mountain coffee beans to be exact, you know. The good stuff. Just as he starts to complain about the imperfections of his egg yolk, a possessed Yoshimi smacks him right over the head with the frying pan. He should have just kept quiet and settled with the Starbucks holiday blend. Sometime later, Tatsuya takes Kyoko and Nobuyuki to his parents' house as both now appear to have been afflicted by the curse. Kyoko has entered an eerie trance-like state and Nobuyuki is strangely drawn to her. Tatsuya's father Taiji says that Kyoko has become possessed by something in apartment 2. He reveals that she has been spiritually sensitive since she was young, something she inherited from him. He never told his wife Fumi because he thought she would leave him if she knew he could see ghosts. He says that Tatsuya must go home and do something about his apartment or he will also be taken by the curse. I love how his advice is simply do something and gives him no advice or information on what to actually do to stop the curse. Oh gee! Thanks, Psychic Dad. He receives a call from his secretary saying that Kyoko is waiting for him at his office, which is impossible because Kyoko is currently busy being creepy at her parents' house. Also, his reaction is absolutely priceless. <laughs> What the secretary actually saw was an apparition of Kyoko, which shows that she is now cursed from having interacted with Tatsuya. Tatsuya goes to the cursed house and speaks with Yoshimi Kitara. Once inside, he discovers Toshio's drawing of his parents and realizes that something isn't quite right. After hearing a cat meow, Yoshimi bows her head and Kayako begins speaking through her. <laughs> Now, this is where the movie gets pretty crazy and we get some of the scariest moments of the entire franchise. Back at the grandparents' house, Fumi begins laughing hysterically and Taiji hears a cat meowing in another room. He sees Toshio's face creepily poking out of the floor and Grandma Fumi literally laughs herself to death. <laughs> Kyoko is now fully possessed by the spirit of Manami Kobayashi and is cradling her undead baby in her arms. Tatsuya discovers Kayako Saiki's diary and receives a call on his cell phone. He hears a cat meowing on the other end, but no worries, it's just Toshio prank calling him. Yoshimi approaches Tatsuya and reveals herself as Kayako before killing him. <laughs> Both Suzuki grandparents are now dead and what follows is perhaps one of the most unsettling things I have seen from this franchise. Kyoko has fully been taken over by the curse and has turned into an Onryo. She is violently waving her head back and forth while holding the undead baby as Nobuyuki quietly watches in the corner. The sound of her hair repeatedly hitting the floor is what disturbed me the most about this scene.
Kyoko Suzuki share some pretty eerie similarities to a character from Ju on the Grudge 2, Kyoko Horase. Without spoiling it for those who haven't seen the later film, both are named Kyoko and their plots heavily revolve around a baby. Sometime later, we see two detectives named Izuka and Kamiyo visiting their old colleague Yoshikawa at his house. Kamiyo, Yoshikawa, and Izuka were the ones investigating the death of Hisayo Yoshida in the previous film. Yoshikawa was afflicted by the curse and is no longer himself. <laughs> One day, the pair of detectives are watching Nobuyuki walking to school. Detective Kamiyo begins to connect all the deaths and disappearances linked to the Saeki house and apartment 205. He shows Izuka a photo of Yoshimi Kitara that was taken by Detective Yoshikawa. In the photo, Yoshimi's face closely resembles that of Kayako Saeki. Realizing that something supernatural and evil is involved, he burns the picture and says that he no longer wants to be a part of the case. Detective Yoshikawa's wife goes to check on him and discovers his dead body. Kayako's face appears in the ceiling and kills her as well. While looking at a photo of Kayako, Detective Izuka is told by a female officer that he has a visitor waiting for him. She notices the picture of Kayako and says that she is the one asking for him. He tells her that Kayako is already dead and we see her ghost walking into the room behind them. Detective Kamiyo runs out screaming and terrified having seen Kayako's ghost in the room. Izuka and the female officer both go into the room and their fates are left unknown. While we never actually see their deaths, I believe that they died the moment they entered the room. The room appeared pitch black and the way they entered the room made me feel that they walked right to their deaths. Kayako suddenly pops out from underneath Kamiyo and kills him. That was honestly one of the scariest jump scares I have seen in a while. The next chapter is titled Nobuyuki, and if a chapter is titled after you in a Juon movie, it ain't looking too good. Nobuyuki is staring out of a window at school as his classmates are playing behind him. He sees Kayako standing outside in the rain, waiting to pick him up from school. She crawls right into the classroom that is now completely empty and dark. The curse seems to have transported him into a darker dimension as Kayako begins chasing him. She multiplies herself to trap him into a corner and takes his soul. Nobuyuki's skin has turned completely white and we see Kayako seemingly holding him in her arms in the corner of the classroom. We also see dozens of Kayako clones outside of the classroom and in the rain. <laughs> One thing to note here is that Kayako appeared to be very affectionate towards Nobuyuki after his death. She was holding him in her arms as if he reminded her of her son. In the close-up shot of Nobuyuki's face, he sort of did resemble Toshio. Aside from Toshio himself, Nobuyuki is the youngest male character to have been cursed. Kayako's spirit possibly feels some type of remorse for having to kill such a young boy. A similar type of affection was shown when Kayako called out Kobayashi's name before killing him. This is just a theory, but I believe that Kayako's spirit is merely an extension of the curse and that she is unable to stop killing. Ever since the Juwan was born, Kayako's spirit has become trapped and unable to move on. She is now forced to kill anyone who becomes cursed and will never be able to stop until she is somehow able to move on. The film's final scene is a chapter titled Saori and takes place sometime after Nobuyuki's death. The entire scene is a single shot of the Saiki house and we only hear the voices and events taking place inside. The cursed Saiki house is once again up for sale, showing that we have learned nothing. We hear the voices of a group of girls inside of the house, though only two are named, Saori and Izumi. A woman briefly approaches the house and quickly walks away. This is possibly the same woman from the very first scene of the previous film. We hear one of the girls finding and drinking from a bottle of sake. This is the same bottle of sake left by Kyoko and Tatsuya Suzuki. Just like Kyoko did years ago, the girl reacts negatively to the sake. We then hear Kayako's death rattle and a cat's meow as the movie ends. This scene is a direct link to the movie's sequel, Juwan the Grudge. There were actually four schoolgirls that snuck into the Saeki house. Izumi, Saori, Ayano, and Chiaki. Izumi became frightened 
frightened, possibly after hearing the death rattle and ran downstairs. She briefly encountered her father, Detective Toyama, in a time loop before running out of the house. Detective Toyama then went upstairs and witnessed the deaths of the three remaining schoolgirls. This last scene was a little difficult for me to piece together. The subtitles for the copy of the movie I watched mentioned two girls by name, Saori and Kazumi. However, there was no girl named Kazumi inside of the house. I don't speak Japanese, but after slowing down the footage where the girl is called out by name, she is clearly saying Izumi. Doing that little investigation to try and connect the two scenes together made me realize just how much care and attention to detail Takashi Shimizu put into these films. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Juon the Curse 2. Juon the Curse 1 and 2 are, in my opinion, the best and most underrated Juon films. They really should have been made into a single two hour movie, and I definitely recommend people watch them back to back. These films have some of the scariest and most disturbing moments of the entire franchise, and it's a real shame that not many people know about them. But, as always, I hope you all enjoy this video. Thank you all for tuning in, and I cannot wait to see y'all right back here in the horror mine. Y'all stick around.